ancient texts, cryptic numbers, symbolic imagery depicting awesome apocalyptic events. For many, the Bible and its prophecies seem shrouded in mystery. Words like Armageddon and tribulation frighten millions, while others wonder how to avoid the mark of the beast or being left behind when the Lord returns. Can we understand the Bible? Yes. And Jesus holds your key to unlock a future without fear. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents The Prophecy Code with Doug Batchelor. Today's study, The Richest Caveman. Welcome to another Prophecy Code meeting. My name is John Lomaking, and I'm excited that you've taken the time to sit down and prepare for the blessing that God has prepared for you. This morning, there's a thrilling testimony that's going to awaken your senses to God's power to change your life as Pastor Bachelor shares his story entitled, The Richest Caveman. From the guttermost, the Lord saved him to the uttermost. I want to like us to pray together and invite God's presence to be with us. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for your love, for your kindness, and for the message, Lord, that has been anointed night by night, for the minds that are being informed, and for the lives that are being transformed. We pray for your presence to be with Pastor Bachelor this morning. Give him words of encouragement and inspiration, and may someone's life be different as they have an encounter with you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, friends, join me as we welcome our Presenter for the series, director, speaker, and president of Amazing Facts, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Good morning. Thank you, John. Good morning. I am so thankful to see you here for this special program. This is so exciting. We have approximately uh, 1,950 to 2,000 groups just in Canada, North America, and Australia, New Zealand. There are uh, an uncounted number in other parts of the world that are receiving this program, and, and it is very, very exciting to be part of that. It's time now for our Bible questions. All right, this is a neat one. This is from Carla. It says, Hi, Doug and Prophecy Code team. I live in Auburn, Washington. I attended your first five meetings and love them so much, but then departed on Friday morning, March 11, for an international business trip. I was feeling disappointed that I would be missing your meetings, and now I find myself sitting on the sixth floor in a ho hotel in Amsterdam, Amsterdam, and I'm watching on live online. Wow, thank you for posting your presentations on the website. I will be able to continue watching throughout my entire trip. Amen. I'm so happy to hear your messages and learn more. And that's from Carla. That's so exciting. praise the Lord. There are many ways that uh, people are able to get the good news, aren't there? So we're glad. All right, why is Jesus taking so long to return? Well, you know, when he does come, most people will think it's too soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's not late. When God called Abraham and said, through your descendants, the Messiah would come the first time as a sacrifice, 2,000 years went by before he came from the birth of Abraham and to the birth of Jesus. And Christ said, I will come again. Right now, it's been about 2,000 years. So I think we're right on schedule. The Bible says a day with the Lord is as a 1,000 years. The uh, history in the plan of redemption in this world, suppose that you have roughly 6,000 years, 1,000 years where we live and reign with Christ during the millennium, total of 7,000 years. What is 7,000 years compared to eternity? I mean, it's not, it's a, not even a, a fraction of a fraction. And so uh, Jesus is not late. For us, with our limited lives, it seems like a long time. And that's why the Bible says, this is the patience of the saints. All right. What is a spiritual Jew? Good question. Well, first of all, anybody who accepts Christ by faith becomes a spiritual Jew. Uh, every genuine Christian is a Jew. Follow me now. We're all saved under which covenant? The old or the new covenant? New covenant, correct. Let me quote that to you. I will make a new covenant after those days, saith the Lord, with the house of Israel. The Lord is making the new covenant with who? 
the house of Israel. There is no salvation covenant made with the Gentiles. Paul says that we Gentiles are grafted in, well I should say you because I'm a Jew, Gentiles are grafted in <laughs> to the stock of Israel. And Israel can be grafted back in as well. But all the promises in the Bible, this is a Jewish book and, and we become spiritual Jews in, in essence when we're baptized. That's what that means. Amen. And you, when you read, pardon me, when you read in the Bible about Rahab, she became a mother in Israel. Uh, Ruth, she was a Moabite, but she became a mother in Israel. And they basically were assimilated. They became spiritual Jews as well. Can a person who loses their mental abilities lose salvation? Well, let's get the, the sequence right. Um, God does not uh, eliminate somebody from access to salvation because of a limited mental capacity to comprehend. To whom the Lord has given much of him, he requires much. If a person mentally does not have the ability to comprehend the gospel, God is loving and just. He judges everybody according to their ability. Uh, and there are people who may have lived a life with the Lord their entire lives and then through some accident or chemical problem they become mentally deranged. Maybe it's uh, mental degeneration or Alzheimer's. I knew this dear saint and she was a saint and um, she came down with Alzheimer's and just started acting like a different person. I think God is going to judge her based on her life that she lived before the disease took over. Amen? Amen. If we have backslidden, is it possible to regain our salvation? Well, yes, there's many promises in the Lord. The Lord appeals to backslidden Israel in the book of uh, Hosea. And so God is calling us to return. You've got a number of examples in the Bible from David to Solomon where they wandered and the Lord brought them back again. Even Peter temporarily backslid when he denied the Lord and he was forgiven. He came back. If there's no hope for backsliders, then we're in trouble because uh, the story of the prodigal son is exhibit A. He was in the father's house, he left, and he came home again. So, of course, there's hope for backsliders. Amen? Amen. Yes. Can Christians be perfect like Jesus? Well, in the sense that when we accept Christ, the Lord looks upon us as he did on Jesus when he was baptized, and he says, when you come out of the water after baptism, and you've accepted the provisions of the gospel, and you've repented of your sins and confessed them, God declares to you what he said to Jesus. This is my beloved son or daughter in whom I am well pleased. We are fully um, assimilated into the family of God. We become sons and daughters of God. He covers us with the blood of his son and the robe of his righteousness. And he looks upon us as though we have the same perfect righteousness as, as Jesus. This is what justification is. Can we have a life record like that of Jesus? Well, how many have sinned? We all sin. So, uh, you know, no, we can never have a perfect record like he's had as far as looking at the history of the life because we've all fallen. But when the Lord comes and he looks at us, there's only two classes of people that Jesus is going to see when he comes back. Those that have the character of his son and those who don't. So we must be Christians, our followers of Christ. Amen? Amen. And we're asking him to give us the gift of perfection of his son. So we, will we be perfect before Jesus comes? We need to be. Now, what does that mean? Oh, you, she set me up. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question we get a lot. I believe that we are to continue following on in sanctification. Christian perfection means that Jesus is reigning on the throne of your heart. Allow me to quote from a classic book called Steps to Christ, where the author says, it is not the occasional good deed or the occasional misdeed that determines whose side we are on. It is the habitual words and acts. Paul puts it this way. Let not sin have dominion. Before you're saved, sin has dominion in your life. It rules. The Lord is to be enthroned in our hearts. When we have the experience of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where we love the Lord so much we'd rather die than knowingly disobey him, that's Christian perfection. Amen. It's perfect love. Don't miss this. Matthew, Jesus says, chapter 5, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. But in Luke, he words it differently. Be therefore merciful, even as your Father in heaven is merciful. God is looking for perfect love, perfect mercy. And when we have that love, we'll obey. Didn't we learn that last night? 
Okay, I hope that was direct enough. Amen. Thank you. Doug, are you suspicious of anything that claims that God has hidden the truth in mathematical formulas? Isn't that exactly what is the main premise of the prophecy code lectures? That the code to the prophecies themselves are things hidden in other parts of the Bible? No, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, I believe that there are messages in the Bible that are hidden in the stories. In sometimes it's in allegories. For instance, the story of Joseph is the story of Christ. You think about the story of Joseph. Sold by his brothers for the price of a slave, and yet he forgives them. So there's a number of symbols in the Bible that can be found. For instance, we've learned that a sword represents what? The Word of God. The Word of God. And a woman in prophecy represents a church. And the lamb represents Jesus. And the dragon is? Satan. Satan. And a horn. Horn represents a power. Could be a kingdom or a power. And remember, we, if you go to prophecycode.com, we've got a website and a place where you could look at some of the Bible symbols and their meanings. Well, I'm so thankful to see you here this morning. And uh, please pray for me as I share with you for a number of reasons. Um, I'll be sharing aspects of my testimony this morning that I've not shared before. Uh, since the book first came out, a uh, matter of fact, I might start by uh, um, going to the slides. Believe it or not, that's me. And since the book first came out in uh, 1985 or 86, it's been translated in 10 languages. Of course, a lot has happened. That's 19, 20 years ago while it was still in the writing process. And uh, there is always a risk when someone is sharing their personal testimony that uh, you could make an individual appear bigger than life. And I'm praying that Christ will be held forth uh, through this. I share some of the, the various things that I've been through because I've made a lot of mistakes, hoping that you'll know in spite of those things, God can still reach us and use us. But uh, I also want to be very real uh, and not make things bigger than life. I remember a, a girl was asked in elementary school to do a book report on Abraham Lincoln, and she wanted to make a good impression on her class. And so as she got up to read her book report, she said, Abraham Lincoln was born at a very early age in a log cabin he built with his own hands. <laughs> and uh, sometimes the history in the retelling uh, ceases to be accurate. So uh, be praying for me. Everybody wants happiness. I think that's one thing that we all share in common. But the places and the way that people look for happiness varies greatly. You know, you've heard me mention earlier in the program that I'm tickled uh, when I check out of the newsstand to look at the uh, supermarket tabloids, and sometimes I've just laughed out loud as standing in line. Now, I know that you, you don't read them, but how many of you will admit you read the headlines when you're checking out? And uh, some of them are very entertaining. I've seen some that are uh, really amazing. I hope pe people aren't getting their prophetic information from these because it changes by the week. But um, uh, I remember one that said, uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer Discovered in a Meat Freezer. That's one that really stuck in my mind. And you've probably all seen the one about the bat boy or the boy half alligator and half... <laughs> and I guess there are people that, that uh, are entertained by it, if, if nothing else. I don't want to ridicule. But you know one reason that these are some of the most popular magazines in North America? Is because they are principally dealing with the lives of the rich and the famous. And somehow people believe that if they could experience these lives vicariously. They, they believe the illusion that happiness comes from fame and fortune. That's why many of these TV programs that deal with the, the rich and the famous are so popular. And people want to marry a millionaire. Who wants to be a millionaire? If I could be more popular, more beautiful, I'd be more famous. And it's really a fantasy. It's an illusion. I was raised with an unusual perspective because of the family God placed me in. Uh, my parents were very unusual and driven people. Uh, two more opposite people, I don't think, ever got married. You've heard the expression, opposites attract? Yes. Never is that more true than with my parents. My mother was Jewish by birth. My father was a Baptist. My mother was born in New York City, 
was very sophisticated in that way. My father was an Okie, born in Oklahoma, came during the Dust Bowl to California. She was a Democrat, the head of the women's lib movement in New York City. My father was a redneck Republican. I mean, they were just so completely opposite that it, those that knew them just marveled that the marriage lasted six years. Uh, my mother was <laughs> in show business, and my father was in the aviation business. I'll start more specifically with dad. Uh, a very unusual man. His father died when he was seven years old, left his mother pregnant with three other younger brothers. My father was the oldest, and he learned as a young boy to work very hard during the Depression and uh, was very, very poor. Um, they used to save string. I mean, just to give you an idea of how things were growing up. During World War II, Dad did manage to get some education and got himself uh, flight instruction. He entered World War II as a, a pilot, a flight instructor, and finally went overseas, was there during D-Day, and uh, has uh, you know, a number of interesting stories he could tell. After the war, he wanted to continue working with aircraft. He began to buy and to sell airplanes and was involved in the designing of aircraft. Matter of fact, several in our family. You ever heard of Area 51? My uncle, Jim, who's still alive, worked there. It's true. They'd fly him every week from Burbank to Area 51, and he worked on things like the SR-71 Blackbird and the stealth plane, and uh, all of my dad's brothers, uh, three younger brothers, ended up uh, working at some point in the aircraft business. Dad began to buy and sell planes until he became very successful. Uh, he worked with people like Howard Hughes and was in business with Kurt Kerkorian and a number of these very famous wealthy people. Dad did not like a high profile. He always felt insecure because he was in Oklahoma and didn't have a lot of education. He stayed away from the limelight as much as possible, but we did manage to get a few photographs of Dad. Um, at one point, he owned two airlines, not to man mention air airline leasing companies. He had uh, Aero Air, Capital Air, part of Western Airlines, some of you remember, international air leases. The military leased aircraft from my father. And it was a very lucrative business. Um, anybody for years who wanted to lease an aircraft, they'd call George Batchelor. And he became very, very wealthy. A driven man, worked very hard. Now my father, his first wife and baby died in a plane crash. Uh, it was a tragic story. He was supposed to be on the plane. He missed it. The plane flew into a mountain. And uh, then he married my mom, who was about 10 years younger than dad. And uh, it was a pretty rocky relationship, and they divorced when we were three. And dad, I think, married about five times in his life. Uh, that's not counting relationships in between. And he was always looking for happiness. I could see happiness did not come from money. Uh, when I lived with dad growing up, he had the mansion, Miami Beach. I was born in Burbank, California. But... Uh, uh, Dad moved his business to Miami Beach and uh, then for years had a mansion on an island, one of the Sunset Islands in Miami Beach, and uh, all the toys, a Learjet, this is one of my dad's Learjets, he's had several over the years. At one time he didn't know which one to buy, so he bought three and tried them out, and then sold the other two at a profit. And uh, raced cars and had the Rolls Royce and, and uh, all of the toys that millionaires are supposed to have. Well, we had the butler and the maid and those things. Now, my life was, would go through v very dramatic changes. When I was living with mom in New York City, where she moved, it was so different from when I was living with dad in Miami Beach. And then they'd send us to live with grandma and grandpa, who were very poor most of their lives in California. And my brother and I went through some very radical shifts as we went from place to place. Um, mom and dad both married several times, and we got sent off a lot. This is a picture of, matter of fact, I think this is dad racing. He's in his 70s here when he was racing. He, he was very active for a better part of his life. Uh, this is dad and his mm, third wife. This was after mom. Betty, he was married to Betty for 30 years, a very sweet lady. She was Miss Kentucky, and we're still in communication together. Um, but uh, that fell apart. Dad was a hard person to be married to. He was a driven man. And uh, when that relationship unraveled, Betty divorced dad. Uh, it made Florida headlines. It was the largest divorce settlement in Florida history. Uh, dad had a lot of money, and money did not bring happiness. This is uh, front page here of the Miami 
Herald business section. Still flying high, and the closer print says, let's see if I can read this here. At 71, aviation pioneer George Batchelor isn't ready to descend. He runs one of Miami's most successful businesses, pilots, jets, races, cars, water skis, and is soon to take a bride age 29. <laughs> that had something to do with his divorce with Betty. <laughs> At 71, Bachelor going on 16. Uh, every member of my family, my brother, my mother, my father, my grandparents, has all been in national headlines at some time or another. I don't have time to tell you all about it, but I have an unusual family. Uh, this is one of the few pictures I've got of, uh, uh, that's my brother, Falcon. He had cystic fibrosis and uh, struggled with his health uh, all through his life. His wife, Sandy, who is an attorney, still lives in Florida. My father, it looks like he's a little tired there, and his 29-year-old bride. Uh, and that was really interesting when that happened because uh, well, I've got one more picture here I'll show you. And this, is, this was actually, I think, my 35th birthday. Was that right, dear? And Karen was there that day. Um, it, it's so different because when Dad married, Marianne was wife number four. Yeah, I lose count. It's kind of strange because she's younger than my wife. My wife's six years, in case you're wondering, she's six years younger than me. I know I look older, but I'm just high mileage. I'm not really that old. <laughs> And I had to correct John on that last night, I think. He says, you're Karen's so much younger than you. I said, no, she's not. <laughs> but uh, it was really strange when Dad married Mary Ann because, follow me, this gets very interesting. Dad had a brother-in-law. He was 72, I think, when he got married. He had a brother-in-law that was 11 years old. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Want to meet my brother-in-law? <laughs> Wait, it, it's more interesting. his mother-in-law was younger than me. <laughs> I know, I'll tell you, it was really strange. And then we went to this wedding, and they, they rented the John Deering Mansion in Miami Beach, and it, it just it looked like a royal wedding. I mean, there were helicopters with news people, and this train of limousines coming in, and an army of valet parkers, and everybody stepping from their cars looking like reigning monarchs. I mean, it was the who's who wedding in Miami a few years ago. What was that 10 years ago, dear? At least, huh? And uh, it was really funny because one of my friends told our son Daniel, they said, now Daniel, when you get to the wedding, you make sure and hop up in Mary Ann's lap and say, Grandma, tell us about the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> you don't tell Daniel that. Because he did something very close to that. And, you know, Karen and I and the family, we went to the wedding, and we we're so out of our element. You know, they're going around serving a scargo, and they've got the orchestra playing. There's a gondola in the bay that is taking people in and out, and, and uh, my dad's yacht was parked out back. And this is actually a picture of my dad's yacht in the, in the bay. It's called the Bachelor Party. <laughs> and uh, this is the inside, just to give you a... Uh, uh, Picture that was very, very nice. And during the wedding with Marianne, his alarm went on off on his watch to remind him to take his heart pills. <laughs> and he's marrying a 29 year old. So, uh, and then, you know, actually, uh, she, she took him to Rome. She was an Italian girl and she had connections, and uh, dad got to visit the Pope. And I think that only cost him about $2 million. But, uh, and he said he was so awed by it. All this money and wealth. And still, I live with him. Very unhappy man. I asked him one day, Dad, are you happy? He said, no, nobody's happy. And uh, I said, I'm happy. And this was after I became a Christian. I was talking to my dad about spiritual things. Uh, when we'd go visit him, he'd be so tense all the time. Karen's a physical therapist, and so you'd give him dad a back rub one day. A man's life, Jesus said, does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses, does it? What profit is it if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? And my dad, at one time, he had two or three Rolls Royce and fancy cars in his five-car garage. But Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasure here on earth where moth doth corrupt, or rust corrupts, and moths devour, and thieves break through and steal because the Rolls Royce turns into rust someday, doesn't it? Happiness doesn't come from things in this life. My memories of dad... 90% of the time, 
I'd see him briefly in the morning on his way to work, and he'd always come home intoxicated, and he'd drink himself to sleep every night. Um, what profit is it if you've got all that money and you're miserable? On the other side of the equation, mom and dad very different. Uh, I was born in California, but when they divorced, they both took off different directions. Mom moved to New York City. She was involved in show business. My mother was a very talented, and if you don't mind my saying so, a very beautiful woman. And I guess I took after dad. <laughs> and uh, she was pretty much self-taught, a high school dropout, but she learned to play the piano, the guitar, was a lyricist, started writing songs for Elvis Presley. And uh, some of you remember that name. Any of you remember Andy Williams, Frank Sinatra, and anyone, uh, Frankie Avalon? And uh, she was writing songs for some of those people back then. She was an actress in mostly small parts in big movies. Any of you ever see the Ten Commandments? I think she was a slave. <laughs> Greasing the stone. And whenever we watch it with the kids, we say, there's Grandma! And then she's gone. <laughs> But uh, so she was an actress, but never very successful in that field. Her real success came as a film critic. She was a successful songwriter, a playwright, and a film critic. Uh, she replaced uh, Rona Barrett on Good Morning America, and she was the president and founder of the Los Angeles Film Critics Association. Lived in Beverly Hills at that time, and it's a very, very powerful position. Because when the critics say this movie stinks, the producers, the studios lose millions. When they say it's outstanding, it's more likely then to get Academy Awards, and it makes a lot more money, and people were always sending her gifts, and they're coming by, and they're sweet-talking her, and giving her free cruises, and tickets, and movies, and a very powerful position. And as my brother and I were growing up in New York City, a lot of these people, uh, names that you know in Hollywood, would come in and out of the house, and they were calling our home, and we didn't even know who they were. Most of the time, we didn't know or care, because when you grow up with it, you're sort of immune, you're, you're, you're aloof, you're insulated, you don't, I don't know what it was, but it just didn't impress us the way I see it does other people. And when I tell this story, people say, oh, Doug, nah, you're making all this up. So I drop in a few pictures of mom with different individuals. Uh, you recognize, of course, Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, and uh, do you still remember George Burns? Um, this is mom. Um, these are all black and white just because she had a mural where they were all done in black and white. It's the only way I got them. Uh, Sylvester Stallone. I got one color picture here, and I remember this. I was there when this picture was taken. It's Mom and the Three Stooges. Now, that is the original. Mo and Larry, they had replaced Curly, had passed away, but I got to meet them. And um, they're all 70 years old at that time, and still very funny. Uh, some of you remember Rowan and Martin, and I also got to meet them, went been to their homes. Um, Warren Beatty, um, and uh, who do we have next here? We're going to go through these pretty quickly because it's self-explanatory. There's mom with Jimmy Stewart and uh, uh, mom at dinner with Bob Hope. Um, and then who's this? Natalie Wood. Some people said they looked a little alike. And I don't think she looks anything like Roger Moore, though. <laughs> the former one of the James Bonds, uh, Sally Fields. So these are the people that she, the circles that she was moving in. Uh, Clint Eastwood. And as time goes by and I share my testimony, the young people aren't going to know who these people are, right? Uh, Paul Newman. And uh, I got quite a few in here. I thought I'd pull some of these out. Dustin Hoffman. And so mom was famous. She knew a lot of these people. And growing up, my brother and I knew a lot of these people. And one thing we discovered very quickly is that happiness not only didn't come from fortune, it didn't come from fame. Because in growing up, a lot of these people we knew had money, popular, wealthy, good-looking, all the things that people say, I wish I had, and they killed themselves. Many of them were so miserable and unhappy. Many of them destroyed their lives with drugs. And I'm not saying all of them were like that. Some of them were very nice people and seemed to have their act together, but there was a lot of confusion, a lot of misery, a lot of spiritualism in Hollywood. You'd be surprised. Uh, you talk about God and the Bible and they act like you're so out of touch, but uh, the New Age and these things were very popular among mom's friends. She was into the astrology and all of that business. But when mom died, none of them were there. There were no cameras there. Uh, Karen and I were in the hospital room with grandma and my aunt, and that was it. And uh, even though everyone knew her back then when she was on Good Morning America every day, uh, basically died alone. Happiness does not come from fame and from fortune. 
Now, as I mentioned, um, mom, I think this is when mom was a, uh, a blonde, and uh, mom and dad had two boys. After they discovered Falcon had cystic fibrosis, they decided they shouldn't have any more children. I could have been, I could have had it, and uh, I had a one in four chance of not having it, so I thank the Lord I was born healthy. My brother used to become very irritated. He said, life isn't fair, Doug. He said, I'm so smart, and I'm sick, and you're so stupid and healthy. <laughs> Falcon was my older brother. My father named us both after airplanes. And uh, I was named Douglas after the DC craft, which isn't so bad. I could find my name on a keychain. But my, brother, my poor brother, my father named him Falcon after, I don't know, who knows what, Falcon Fanjet or something like that. And he grew up with the name Falcon Bachelor. And he got teased a lot in school because he was already small from cystic fibrosis. And he had flaming red hair. Uh, we, we didn't look at all like each other, but same mom and dad. Brown eyes, freckles, I've got blue eyes, no freckles, no hair. And, uh, <laughs> but I still wear his, some of the clothes he left me, we were the same size and weight. And, uh, but I really miss my brother. But, uh, he had a tough life. In some ways, because Falcon was sick, I had a tough life. Because a lot of times the parents would take out their frustrations on me because I could, they figured he's healthy, he can handle it. And uh, Falcon would get in trouble, and he'd point to me, and we named him the Little Angel. <laughs> well, we grew up in New York City and uh, lived on 51st Street on the east side, 81st Street on the west side. And uh, there's one reason John and I enjoy working together. We speak the same language. We can talk New York, because he comes from New York City, too. And uh, you become a little bit cynical when you grow up in New York City, because there's so much uh, illusion there. And... I got into a lot of trouble and went to a lot of different schools. I've only completed formally the ninth grade, but I went to 14 different schools, and several of them were boarding schools. My parents would send me off frequently uh, to boarding schools. Sometimes they'd send us off to summer camp because my mother was so driven to be famous and my father was so driven to make money that uh, my brother and I just seemed to get in the way. And uh, I went to, matter of fact, I went to Catholic school, I went to military school. First military school I went to was Black Fox Military Academy. And I understand Donald Trump went there too. And um, I was five years old. You can tell folks wanted to get us out of the house. And again, I went to New York Military Academy when uh, I was 11 years old till 13. And I went to Jewish schools. I went to two different Catholic schools, a number of uh, public schools, uh, matter of fact, and this is another picture of me in New York Military Academy. And you know, one thing I remember is that I was probably happier there at New York Military Academy than I was at several other schools. And you know why? I think it's because I, it was the first time I'd really had structure and discipline in my life. And I learned something that you cannot be happy without self-control and discipline. Now, for those of you who are parents and some kids who might be listening, I went to another school when I was... I got into trouble and I was in and out of jail. I went to another school when I was 14 years old, 15 years old, called Pine Hinge. Matter of fact, I found it on the internet and I'm trying to hook up with some of the old students. It was an experimental school in Maine for kids who had um, trouble adapting to normal education and it operated on the principle that you can't force a young person to learn. You need to just put them in an environment where they're exposed to things and they'll teach themselves. You didn't have to go to class if you didn't want to. It was a boarding school, co-ed, from 8 to 18, co-ed dorms, co-ed rooms. You did no dress code, no rules. Well, they had three rules. Three rules were no drugs, no fighting, no sex, and nobody paid attention to the three rules they did have. It was the most bizarre, unbelievable school you can imagine. And... So I went to a school that was the strictest school in North America, New York Military Academy. It's the elementary school for West Point. Strictest school in North America. And I went from there to the most liberal, unstructured school in North America. Where do you think I was happier? Several young people attempted suicide at Pinehenge. And the school closed down, I think, the year after I left. Might have had something to do with our raiding the kitchen every day. And, but... Uh, and I think I set the building on fire once by accident. <laughs> Matter of fact, true story, I went to three schools that caught on fire. But I was only responsible once. <laughs> In 
Now, I was very unhappy, and I should add that mom and dad, while mom had a Jewish background, she was not religious. Very zealous about being Jewish, but didn't believe in God. You know, you, you can be Jewish as far as a Jew by race and not be a religious Jew. And mom was very loyal to her race, but uh, she had no time at all for Christianity especially. They were the enemy. And mom growing up used to say things that uh, now I shudder at. I mean, she said that uh, the only reason Jesus didn't get married is because he must have been gay. And that uh, the Bible was just a bunch of fables. And Christians kill all the Jews through history. And they use the Bible as the excuse. And I hated the Bible. I thought it was, uh, I was raised to believe that, uh, especially the New Testament, was f uh, just uh, a lot of propaganda, anti-Jew propaganda. And um, dad while he was raised a Baptist, after World War II, he just began to wonder, if there's a God, why would he allow all this death and suffering? And so I was pretty much raised an atheist. It's interesting that the parents would send me to religious schools, but they thought they had better academics. And you know something? If young people are raised without believing there's a God, I, I don't see how they can be happy. Because I'm convinced you can't be happy if you don't know something about where you came from, what you're doing here, and where you're going. And I didn't have these basics. And so I, six, seven years old, I began to think, nobody's happy. Fame doesn't bring happiness. For, fortune doesn't bring happiness. And what's the purpose of life? I believed in evolution. You know, you live a little while, you die, you turn back into fertilizer. And there's really not much purpose to life. And I think that might have something to do also with the high percentage of suicides among young people, teenagers in particular. They're being told there's no purpose. If they're being told they're nothing more than glorified monkeys, you can understand life doesn't hold any purpose. And as soon as things get tough and their friends start to ostracize them, they figure, what's the use? And they take their lives. I started thinking about suicide when I was seven years old. Seriously, I used to wonder what the best way would be to kill myself. And part of it, I think, also has to do with a broken home. Kids that get bounced around between their grandparents and their mother and father, and they don't feel like they belong. One reason I used to think about suicide is I thought, I'll get my parents' attention if I can kill myself. It was a desperate plea to get their attention. And I still remember when I lived in New York City, I'd find my way up to the roof, and I'd stand on the precipice of these buildings, sometimes 20 stories up. We lived in apartment buildings. And... Uh, I'd get out there and I'd stand right on the edge and I'd play this game where I'd see how far out I could lean until I felt my center of gravity. And I used to think, see, you, you'd be amazed how often I thought about jumping. Just jump. End all your troubles. And the only reason I didn't jump is because I thought, what if I jump and I don't die? Periodically, I'd, I'd hear about people who just got mangled. I don't want to get mangled. And I remember one time my... Um, Falcon had gone to live with dad in Florida for his lungs, his lung disease, and the in New York City pollution was pretty bad on his lungs, and I was by myself with mom, and she was off and out working or at parties at night, and I just felt so alone, and uh, I was in trouble at school, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to kill myself, and I knew mom took sleeping pills every night, so I went into her bathroom, and I got into the medicine cabinet, and I looked on the bottles, and I found one that said, take one at bedtime. And I filled my hand, I got the water, I was just ready to take the pills. And I thought, you know, it didn't really say sleeping pills in the bottle. It said take one at bedtime. And I studied it, and the bottle said Valium. They were sleeping pills, now I know. But then I was 13 years old, and I thought, Valium. That might be a pill for ladies, I don't know. <laughs> and I don't want to get sick. I don't want to get sick, I wanted to die. And so, you know, somewhere along the way in there, I thought, I, I really did want to die, because I thought, life, people aren't happy. But... One of the things that kept me alive was I have an insatiable curiosity, and I kept thinking, you know, if I kill myself today, something interesting is bound to happen tomorrow, and I'm going to miss it. <laughs> and so you'd be surprised, I postponed my suicide one day at a time for years because I thought, may as well stick around one more day. I can make it one more day. And that's some advice for anyone out there that thinks about it. Postpone it, because once you do it, you can't turn back. You know, I get phone calls every now and then from people asking about suicide and I say suicide is one of the biggest mistakes anyone could make because you destroy all your options and if you think suicide is going to remove your problems what it does is it permanently seals your problem with no alternative as long as you're alive Solomon said a living dog is better than a dead lion where there's life there's hope right Amen. and so I just kept putting it off and 
And praise God. I mean, the Lord, I know many times the Holy Spirit said, I've got a plan for you, not today. And finally, I thought, you know, why die by doing something boring, taking pills, jumping off a building? I said, I want to die with excitement. I'd watch this beer commercial, old Schlitz beer commercial. It said, you only go around once in life, get all the gusto you can. I didn't know what gusto was, but it sounded good to me. So I said, I'm going to have as much excitement as I can. And I began to live a very rebellious life. And that was probably right around 12, 13, 14 uh, I started drinking and using drugs. As a matter of fact, I could probably say at this point, uh, I got a little help from my parents. I remember when I was 13 years old, mom said to me one day, Doug, I know you're going to run into this stuff. You've heard about how parents need to talk to their kids about drugs. Well, my mom did. She said, I know you're going to run into this stuff on the streets, and I just assume that you did it at home where you won't get into trouble. And so she rolled a joint and started smoking it with me. And then later it was hashish, and uh, mom already served alcohol with our dinner, and so we could drink at home. And uh, a lot of people in show business use drugs, and mom not only took pills, ups and downs, and LSD, and pot, and hashish, but uh, a lot of people in Hollywood use drugs now, as I guess all kinds of exotic things are using. So I, it became a regular thing with mom. At least twice a week, we would smoke pot, watch TV, and eat ice cream. And... Um, Falcon would come and visit from Florida and he'd feel left out because he, with his lung condition, couldn't smoke pot. So mom would make him marijuana or hashish cookies. Mom was a good cook. And uh, I remember one day uh, I took him to a school party and we gave him to the teachers. <laughs> See if we could get them to loosen up a little bit. <laughs> so. so then I, when I was leaving with dad... Dad thought that, uh, you know, pot and those things were uh, shameful, but he drank himself into a stupor every day, and he had a bar in the house, had a butler and a maid and a complete bar that he kept well stocked, and it, very early, I started emptying my dad's martini glasses when I was a toddler. I still remember doing that and emptying the glasses and eating the olives in the bottom, but um, when I was living with dad in Miami Beach, we could go into the bar whenever we wanted and just wait until the butler wasn't there. Dad was at work and Betty was out shopping and we'd drink. We'd invite our friends to drink and they, we drank an awful lot. And, and uh, Dad never knew. If he did, he never said anything because the butler thought Dad was just drinking more than usual and he'd replace it. So Dad never knew it was missing. And I got into a lot of trouble. And I was in and out of jail. You know, most of it was because it was a plea for attention. And I wanted my friends to like me. My parents were so busy with their careers that I started trying to get attention and acceptance and love from my friends. And I found I didn't seem to get any positive attention for being good. I only got attention for being bad. And as you may have guessed, I was sort of the class clown. And I was very disruptive and rebellious and started getting involved in crime. And... Uh, not because I needed the money, but I began to get involved in burglary and, and uh, drugs for the excitement. My friends would dare me to jump off a bridge, and I'd do it in Biscayne Bay. They'd dare me to break into a house, and we began to get involved in burglary. And what's really strange is the island I was living on with Dad, Sunset Island number one, a lot of millionaires lived around that island. You heard of Firestone Tires? I used to date Amy Firestone. Karen's better looking. Just want you to know that. <laughs> um, you've heard of Hoover vacuum cleaners? Sandy Hoover. He's a boy. Sandy Hoover was one of our friends that lived on the island. Because not a lot of us played with Sandy because he was a little different. You know what his goal was in life? Whenever Sandy would ride his bicycle around the island, he'd come up to a stop sign and he'd go, everybody off. He was always pretending his bike was a bus. He wanted to be a bus driver. The heir to the Hoover vacuum cleaner dynasty. Last I heard, you know what Sandy was doing? Driving a limo on a bus. Happiness doesn't come from money, does it? But the other kids on the island that uh, we play with, we'd get into trouble and we'd start breaking into homes just for the excitement. All these millionaire kids were breaking into the mansions of the other people that lived on these islands. And they had guards you had to go by to get there. And we'd get bored and they'd dare me to break into a house and I'd do it and... It didn't matter, just we'd steal anything just so we could say we broke in. And uh, my friends would dare me to break into a house while people were still awake and walking around in the house. 
and I wanted their acceptance so much. You know, it was really strange though. There was this ki crime spree on the island of all the millionaires' kids breaking into each other's homes, and the security company for the island thought that thieves were coming by boat. And so we would sit there on the dock and we watched these police boats circling the island at night trying to catch the thieves. And it was all the students, all the, the children of the, uh, the millionaires breaking into each other's homes. But, um, and I'm making a long story short. I've been uh, in and out of jail several times and chased by the police and shot at. And, uh, and I'm not proud of these things, but just to give you a picture of where I was. I ran away from home first time when I was 13 years old. Uh, have been in reform school for brief periods of time because I was in trouble. One time I got arrested and I wouldn't tell them who I was because I'd rather stay in jail than go back home again. I was so unhappy. And uh, last time I left home I was 15 years old when I ran away. Hitchhike up to Boston. Father said, I'm through with you. I don't know what to do with you. And uh, began to uh, break into homes. Now I was a burglar, not for entertainment, but I needed the money. And I became a thief, and I was stealing cars, and I was stealing televisions, and I had a part-time job as a security guard at the same time. <laughs> I, I know that sounds really bizarre, but it is absolutely true. I was 16 years old at this point, and I had a driver's license that said I was 18. So here I'm a big shot, you know, walking around in this oversized uniform in Boston with a weapon, and I'm a security guard, and, and I had a license so that I could uh, buy, I was buying alcohol, and, and uh, I would guard places at night and I'd steal during the day because if you walk out of a house at night with a TV, you look suspicious. But if you do it during the day when the people are at work, they think you're just moving. <laughs> and so this is how I was living. And then a friend of mine who was into these Eastern religions, he knew about my day job. His name was Jerry. And uh, he said, I said, you gonna turn me in? He said, no, Doug, I don't need to turn you in. He says, God sees what you're doing and your karma is gonna get you. Now, karma is this ethereal rule that whatever you do comes back. With what measure you meet, it's measured to you, is how Jesus put it. And there is an element of truth in that. When you live on the streets, they put it this way. What goes around comes around. You're going to get what you give. And there's an element of truth in that. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I said, nah, there's no God. And I said, I stole that TV and I got rid of it. Nothing happened to me. Nothing's going to happen. He said, you'll see. And not long after he told me this, I woke up in my apartment in Boston, and my door was open, and my television was gone. <laughs> and my radio. And I was really mad. I called the police right away. I wanted them to <laughs> track down. I felt they invaded my privacy. I wanted them to catch these thieves. And, and I started watching, and it began to slowly dawn on me that I wasn't getting ahead. Because I would like, everything I did went wrong. I'd steal something. I'd often do it while I was drunk or high, and I'd hide it, and then I'd sober up and forget where I hid it. Or I would steal something, and my friends were all thieves. They would, in turn, then steal it from me. Say, I don't know where it went. <laughs> and, um, or I would risk my life to steal like a stereo or something. I'd get back to my place, plug it in. It was broken. I stole a broken stereo. <laughs> and just everything was going wrong, and I said, man... What convinced me may seem strange. It was a little thing. I didn't quit stealing cold turkey. I tapered off. I used the patch. And, uh, <laughs> but I was at someone's house, and I stole a box of Krusty's Instant Pancake Mix. Any of you remember that? It was the whole wheat variety. And um, I did it because even though here I am a hippie, you know, and I'm, I'm drinking and smoking, taking drugs and LSD and staying up all night, but... I only eat whole wheat because the other stuff's not good for your health. <laughs> and so I steal this box of pancake mixes. It's the whole wheat variety. And on the top of the box, it was stamped $1.19. This is before the days of the barcode, the little blue circle. And you remember that? Stamped on top, $1.19. That same day, some friends went through my place. I had a brand new jar of Tang Instant Breakfast Drink. They took the jar. They drank the whole thing. And there by the empty jar was a lid stamped, and it said $1.19. And I looked at the pancake mix, $1.19, and I thought, crime doesn't pay. <laughs> there must be a God. Once I realized there was a God, I really began to search. And while I was there in Boston, I began to explore a broad spectrum of different religions. First thing I did is I turned on the TV, and I saw on the news where it said the Protestants are killing the Catholics, and the Catholics are killing the Protestants in Ireland, you know, and... 
and they both claim to be Christians and blowing each other up. I said, ah, Christians are all hypocrites. Or I'd watch some of the broadcast Sunday morning with the televangelist. And for me, they were the lowest life form there was. Doesn't God have a cruel sense of humor? <laughs> and now I'm a televangelist. <laughs> and they're all begging for money, you know. And, and I said, oh, man, they're all, Christians are all hypocrites. That's what I said. And I still run into people who say, I'd be a Christian, but they're all hypocrites, you know. I've come to learn a Christian is not a follower of Christians. A Christian is a follower of who? Of Christ. And people will let you down. Jesus will never let you down. And so I began to get into a lot of the more exotic religions. And I started looking into some of the New Age religions. I looked into Buddhism. And my mother was wish, wishing I had stayed with Zen Buddhism. And uh, Hinduism. And transcendental meditation. And I would sit by the hour and meditate and try to be at one with the God in me. And I always thought, looking back now, it was peculiar that someone have to say, don't you know that you're God? Because you'd think even if you're a little God, you'd be smart enough to recognize it. No one would have to tell you, right? But I was trying to find the God within me. And I already, of course, had my uh, Jewish background. And so I tried to mix the Kabbalah and some of the Jewish tradition. And I was creating a milkshake of different religions, trying to find the truth. And the Lord knew I was searching. And I had been to the Catholic schools and was... Uh, doing the repetitive prayers. And I thought, if I mix a, a one our Father with an Om and uh, do this, these meditatings, that maybe I'd, I'd find God. And uh, I really did search. Matter of fact, I was hitchhiking all over the country. I have been, I probably got 100,000 miles on my thumb. I mean, I have been all over. I've been from the East Coast to the West Coast, from Florida to Maine, all over the country, hitchhiking. I was really searching for God. And you know, God, as mixed up as I was, God knew I really was searching for the truth. And I was confused. I remember one time I went to Southern California with a friend named Jay Samuels from Brooklyn, New York. And uh, we were living on the streets. And we went to a Christian mission because they offered free food. But before you get your food, you had to listen to someone preach. And so they bring you all in and they shut the door. And then they, um, they preach to you and they testify. And I'm so embarrassed now because the crew I was with, I mean, we were with a bunch of drug addicts and alcoholics. We were so disrespectful and rude and they were belching and, and falling asleep and being rude. And then when they got done, they were, these people, these Christians were so nice and loving and smiling. Now, this can't be real. And then they fed us this great meal with cherry pie and everything. And I thought, these folks are so nice to these bums that are rude. That's what I thought. I was embarrassed to go back because they were so nice to us. Well, we found out that the Hare Krishna temple also served free food. So I said, Jay, let's go down there. So we went to the Hare Krishna temple in Santa Monica, California. They said, but you've got to go to our services before we feed you. We said, we understand. That's the rule. So we went and their services <laughs> involved jumping up and down for an hour and a half. And they said, <clears throat> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. I never forgot it because they did it for an hour and a half. And at one point, I actually went to the bathroom because I said, this is just hypnosis. <laughs> they had a drum going, bum, 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 and they had a bass, Hare Krishna. And I saw these guys in their pajamas and shaving their head and all this, and I thought, they've got to be hypnotized. No one else would do this. <laughs> so I went to the bathroom, and I waited and waited until the music started dying down. I went back in because I wanted the food, and Jake was starting to get into it. He's Hare Krishna. <laughs> I had to get him out of there. And... Um, after all that jumping up and down, they gave us yogurt and raisins. And that was, I knew that day I couldn't ever join that religion. Well, I went back to Boston, and while I was living on the streets in Boston, I actually had two jobs. And uh, I had cut down on my stealing, but I was working as a security guard part-time, and I was working in a, a rust-proofing factory. We would rust-proof, like, the steel toes and boots and... It wasn't very exotic, but it was honest. And I had a lot of money because between selling drugs and the work, I was, I, I'm a little driven, my, like my parents, very motivated. And my dad came to visit me one day, and I was big shot. I said, you want, let me buy you dinner, Dad. And I said, I got my own apartment now, and I was showing him all this stuff, and he was so discouraged. He said, Doug, he says, you're throwing your life away. He says, you need an education. He says, you know your brother's sick. I've got a stepbrother, John, uh, who, um, from uh, Betty, who worked for dad until dad died. And um, he said, Falcon's sick. He said, if you ever want to work for me, you've got to get an education. He said, I found a school. You're going to love this. 
He said, this is a school on a boat. He says, there's girls, you sail around the world, you get to see the sights, you water ski, you scuba dive. He says, give school one more chance. He says, you're going to love this. And he was pleading with me. And I, you know, I just couldn't tell him no. And so I said, all right, all right. And so he was so excited, he took me right then to the airport. I don't know who he paid, but he got me a passport and a passport picture within a few hours. And he took me to the airport. He flew with me to Milan, Italy, where the boat was parked, docked, handed me over with a smirk on his face, and then I found out I'd been duped. <laughs> this school that he made sound so good was actually a very unusual, exclusive school for the children. It was called the Flint School Abroad. There were two schools like this. They made a movie about one of them called White Squall. I don't know if any, have you ever heard about that. That one was all boys. Our school was co-ed, the Flint School. School on a boat. It was for the children of politicians and millionaires whose kids were getting mixed up in drugs or the wrong crowd or some cult religion to get them out of their environment and straighten them out. And it was very strict. They took away your passport. They said, basically, if you run away in Turkey or some of these countries, you get arrested. They, they put the fear in you. They said, there's nothing anyone can do. You're going to rot in jail. So they really had us, like, imprisoned. And uh, I was so mad because here I'd been living on my own, like a big shot, 18 years old, had my own job, and, and uh, now I'm a kid again. So I rebelled. And uh, they couldn't. At military school, you misbehave. They hit you. Back then, they could do that. Now I don't think they can do it anymore. But this school, they couldn't touch these kids because they were the kids of the millionaires, you know. And so I said, I'm not going to class. So I just stayed in my room. And then they said, all right, well, then you have to sit on the floor during meals. So I sat on the floor, and I goofed off and disrupted everything. And I was just infuriated that I had been tricked. I never did go scuba diving or water skiing or these things that I thought. Furthermore, they taught atheism in the school. It was the curriculum. They showed films of Darwin. They mocked anyone who believed in God as a fool. And now I believed in God. I had seen too many things I couldn't explain. I knew there had to be a God. And uh, so I'm in my room meditating. They finally said, we're not letting you go to meals. And I had my roommate smuggle me food. And this battle between me and the, the captain is the principal. It went on for a while until pretty soon the students, I would not stand watch. I would not participate. It was a protest. I'm very stubborn. And uh, oh, I thought Karen would go amen at that point. Thank you for controlling yourself. <laughs> captain took me for a walk one day and he said uh, bachelor what do we need to do to get you to cooperate I said ah he wants to negotiate I said if you let me go home for Christmas break I'll behave between now and Christmas two weeks away only model students got to go home for Christmas he was so anxious to get rid of me he walked right from that conversation he said is that a deal I said that's a deal he walked he called my dad woke him up because of the time zone. I said, Mr. Bachelor, we've got good news. Doug has shown remarkable progress, and we think he's going to be ready to go home <laughs> for Christmas. My dad was so happy. So I behaved for the next two weeks until Christmas, and I stood watching, washed dishes, and did my job and went to class. But I learned something interesting. While we were saving, sailing from Tunis, Africa, northern Africa, across the Mediterranean just before Christmas time to Port of Mahon, Spain, we got into a very severe winter storm. And the boat we were on, this is actually a picture of the two boats that you see here. I, I was able to capture this from the website. Um, Two-mast schooner, about 150 feet long. Waves were 25, 30 feet. Uh, boat was going up and down through the waves. Water was coming in. The mainsail ripped. Wind was howling so loud, Captain asked if someone would help drop the sail and go back up again, and you could scream at the top of your lungs to somebody just five feet away, they couldn't hear you. Everybody was seasick, including the captain. How do you think that made people feel? Captain said, if you get washed overboard, and things were washing overboard. The nose of the ship was going through some waves, and part of the wave would roll from bow to stern over the boat and take things with it. We were wearing this foul weather gear, but we were freezing out there because it's the Mediterranean in winter. And he said, if you get washed overboard, we're not even going to turn around because we'll never find you. We'll mark the spot and tell your parents where we lost you. You better hang on. And I uh, tell you what, it was a pretty scary experience. Everyone was looking for the place in the middle of the boat because th so many were seasick. If you went below deck, it looked like some great hand had taken the ship and turned it upside down and shook it because in the halls and all over the rooms were the books and the mattresses and everybody's seasick. Do I need to say more? 
It was awful. And uh, what do you think all those atheists started doing when they thought they were going to die? It was amazing. Nobody needed any lessons at all. <laughs> Nobody was going, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. <laughs> People were praying and making promises to God, and I probably made a few. And you know what else is interesting is people always know when they're doing something wrong because when they're about to die, they know what to confess. And they know what to promise God they'll never do again. But you know, fear is the wrong reason to serve God. It might be a starting point coming to God. Nothing wrong. If fear drives you to the Lord, then praise the Lord that you came to your senses because you were doomed until you came to your senses. But the best reason to serve God is love. If you're only serving God because of fear, then if you should get to heaven, you'll lose your motive. Right? Well, as soon as the storm was over, everybody forgot their prayers and their promises, including Doug. I told the people, as soon as I got on the airplane flying home, I said, you will never see me again, and they never have. I bought a beer and a pack of cigarettes, and uh, when I got back to Florida, Dad took the family snow skiing, and he was so happy that I was doing better at school. I thought, well, I'll go on a vacation with the family before I run away. So after we got, skiing, got done skiing in Canada, I sold everything I owned to my brother, who was a very shrewd businessman, to get as much money as I could, and I took off hitchhiking to California. While I had been there at 15, 16 years old, I'd found a cave, and I wanted to move out to this cave. And on my way out, I had a very interesting experience. I was hitchhiking from Miami, Florida to California. And if you don't know, that's a long way. Yes. Christmas time, I left Florida with Florida clothing. In Virginia, I lost all my money drinking and playing pool. I got drunk. And by the way, of all the drugs I've used, you know, cocaine and marijuana and LSD and ups and downs and hash and you know, more of my friends died from alcohol than all the others put together. It just really worries me that every now and then I run into a Christian that thinks drinking's okay. I got drunk. I lost all my money making stupid bets. I'm a pretty good pool player when I'm sober, right, John? Oh, come on now. <laughs> and um, I got out on the highway the next day, and I really felt like at the bottom. Because here I am, first of all, I'm freezing to death. I'm in Oklahoma. I got stuck in Oklahoma. And uh, I remember every time a truck went by, I'd count to three, and I'd turn around, and then three seconds after the truck went by, the wind from the truck would hit me, and I was just bitterly cold. I was sick from drinking, hangover. I was all out of money. I did not like myself. And, I mean, I really was a rotten person. I'll give you an example. When I was stealing cars, I stole this one car. A few weeks later, came back to steal the same car. There's a note taped on the steering wheel. I'm in there with my little flashlight getting ready to steal the car. I'm reading this note, a little index card. It says, please don't steal my car. <laughs> it says, I'm a pastor, and every time my car is stolen, it costs me a fortune to get it out of the tow yard. Please don't steal my car. I laughed, and I stole the car and left it in New York City after taking it from Boston. I didn't care. I had a friend who got a brand new bicycle for his birthday. I broke into his home. I stole his bicycle, sold it to another friend who, it was a very expensive bike. Painted it, changed the serial numbers. I then stole it from him and sold it to another friend. <laughs> so when I said I was a rotten person, I really was a very selfish person. You know why? I didn't think anybody cared about me, and so I made up my mind I'm not going to care about anybody. Well, while I'm out there on the highway, I prayed because I became desperate. And I asked God for four things. I said, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I didn't even know how to pray. Well, I remember my Jewish parents taught me a Jewish prayer, and I didn't even know what it meant. Baruch atah, anoy Eloheinu, melech olam. So I didn't even know how to pray. I could say Our Father, going to Catholic school, or Hail Mary. But I just prayed from my heart. I said, Lord, I know you're there. I know there's a God. I know I'm an awful person. Will you forgive me? I needed forgiveness. And will you help me? And I said, Lord, please, I need four things. I said, I need a ride to where I'm going, 2,000 miles away. See, please give me a ride. Please help me get some food. I'm hungry. Please help me get some money. I'm broke. And the fourth thing, I prayed the Lord would give me a ride with somebody normal because I kept getting picked up by these lunatics, you know. <laughs> I got picked up by people 
I remember this one guy drinking picked me up and he said, watch this, I can drive with, without my lights on. And he'd turn off the lights on a windy road. Or I get picked up by a couple of college students that were smoking so much pot, they obscured the visibility in the car, they went across the median on the interstate into oncoming traffic. Or I'd get picked up by people that had sexual motives. Uh, and so you gotta pray, you think it's dangerous to pick up hitchhikers? It's a lot more dangerous to hitchhike. So I said, Lord, give me a ride with someone normal. As soon as I finished praying, right there on Interstate 40, the next vehicle stopped. I'd been there eight hours. As soon as I finished praying, he stopped. There was a white van. He picked me up. He took me 2,000 miles to the door of where I was going in California. He fed me all the way out. I didn't ask him to. He gave me $40 when he dropped me off that I didn't ask for. I should mention I also did not ask for him to preach to me all the way from Oklahoma <laughs> to Palm Springs, California. This was, I just wanted a ride, but the Lord sent a born-again Christian. And he was preaching to me and reading the Bible and sharing it with everybody along the way. And this fellow was really aggressive about sharing his faith. And I kind of had to listen to him. You know, I'd be sitting there and he'd be preaching. And I'd be thinking, yeah, right, uh-huh. I had to either listen or get out. But, you know, I did pick up something. I now do that. I think it's a good way to share your faith. If you're not afraid to pick up hitchhikers, what you do is you pick them up and you wait until you're doing about 60 miles an hour and you make your gospel presentation. <laughs> then you accelerate and look at them and say, now would you like to accept Jesus? And don't look at the road. <laughs> and a lot of people have found the Lord in my car <laughs> that way. It's true, I do pick up hitchhikers and I, and I witness to them along the way. But, you know, I had to listen to this guy, but I really believe the Bible was a fairy tale. I mean, who can believe these stories about Adam and Eve and Noah and the ark? And my mom had always told me in this, most of the schools I went to that this was just fiction. So now I moved up into the mountains, into a cave, way back in the hills above Palm Springs, California. My brother came to visit me once, and he took these pictures. And I lived there a year and a half like a hermit. And it was a long way out of town. I used to have to climb from Palm Springs to this mountain that was over... 4,500 feet, and then back down the other side. Very rugged, steep, dry, dangerous terrain. Several people died up there in the time I lived there. And the mountain was Mount San Jacinto, one of the tallest mountains in Southern California. It's 11,000 feet high. And uh, I lived in this cave. It was a beautiful cave. I mean, as far as caves go. Uh, right by the cave, I had a creek that ran by. I was very comfortable. My cave was very neat. It was the neatest cave there was because I went to military school. My bed was made every day, and I had all my stuff in its place. You can ask Karen. I'm sort of a fanatic that way. Yeah, there you go. I knew I'd get an amen on that one. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I make my hotel bed when I check out. Just, uh, so pray for me. There's a beautiful waterfall and a pool right by my cave. That was my cat, Stranger. He just showed up one day, lived with me for a year, and then disappeared. And uh, I'd go to sleep at night, and Stranger would come at night, and he'd press his nose when it was cold, he'd press on my nose until I opened up my sleeping bag and he'd crawl down by my feet. He'd purr down by my feet. It was great. But sometimes he'd go out hunting and he'd like make a skunk mad and chase a skunk through my cave. But I had a lot of experiences I can't share. But the real miracle is while I was living up here, somebody uh, had left a Bible in the cave. And somebody asked me one time, was it a King James Version? Did the Gideons put it there? You know, the Gideons put them in all the hotel rooms. They want to know if now they're going to all the caves everywhere. The Gideons. <laughs> no, it was just the regular King James Version of the Bible. And at first I ignored it. I would hike down to town once or twice a week. I used to panhandle. I'd beg for money and I'd play the flute. I'd buy my groceries or I'd dig in the dumpster. And then I'd head on home. And, uh, you know, I had to pause here and just mention, eventually my father found out how I was living and when he found I was digging in the dumpster looking for food, how do you think that made him feel? That broke his heart. And so uh, you've got a heavenly father. And it breaks his heart when we go to the garbage of the world looking for happiness because it will never satisfy. Well, as I began to read the Bible, I finally picked it up one day and I didn't understand everything I read. When I read through the Old Testament, I got through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament and uh, I didn't understand a lot, but I found a version of the Bible maybe a little simpler, and two things became very clear to me. One, I was a big sinner, and that Jesus was a big Savior. 
it also became clear to me that God had a plan for my life. And I got on my knees up there in the cave, and I said, Lord, I'm a big zero. I mean, I'm running around up in the mountains. Did I mention I didn't wear any clothes up there? I'm running around naked up in the mountains. Uh, long hair and a beard, digging in the dumpster, drinking and smoking and using drugs, stealing, living immorally. And I asked the Lord, I said, will you forgive me for my sins and come into my heart and give me some purpose for living? I mean, I was a big zero. And, you know, God came into my heart back then. And he didn't change me all at once, but he started changing me. And he started working miracles where I knew he was real. I remember at one point, oh, this is a picture of, that's me in my cave with Stranger. I had clothes on, so I thought I'd show you that picture. <laughs> and it was, of course, from reading the Bible this happened. At one point, I was up there, and, and I was reading the Bible, and I thought, I want to share God's word with other people, but I don't know how this is ever going to happen because um, nobody's going to know me up here. And uh, I said, Lord, I'd like to witness for you, but I don't know how I'm going to do that because I live in a cave all by myself. I would go days without seeing another human. No radio, no TV, no cell phone, no human contact for days. Right after I prayed that prayer, I went to town. I called mom who lived in Beverly Hills. She said, Doug, I'm coming by to see you. I said, what do you mean? She said, NBC's coming with a helicopter. We want to interview you. They're doing a national human interest story on this millionaire son that lives in a cave. I said, you're kidding. So they flew up to my cave with a helicopter and interviewed me for the news. And it was on three times that day. The only reason I know that, I didn't have a TV. My friends in jail said they saw it three times. <laughs> and while I was on national news, he's saying, why do you live like this? And I was able to share my testimony about how I'd become a Christian and happiness didn't come from money. So here I just prayed God would give me an opportunity to witness. So oh, how could I ever witness to anybody? I live in a cave. Don't underestimate what God can do if you're willing to work for him. He sends national news to give me an opportunity to share my faith. In the time that's passed, and I'm just making a, a lot has happened since then until now, a uh, family and I, we've been up to the cave a few times. Uh, this is a picture, I think, of when Karen and I went up there with the kids. I don't know how long ago this was, dear. Um, 1992, we, that's from the top of the mountain. My cave was just over that hill and down the other side. 1992, we flew up. Some people think Christians can't have fun. You know, they say, oh, I'd like to be a Christian, but, you know, you don't have any fun. You can't drink and use drugs and all these things and all those sins. I have so much more fun now as a Christian than I ever had before. As a matter of fact, you young people who think it's not fun to be a Christian, you ought to try and follow Pastor Doug around. Keep up with him. Uh, ask John. He's been to our house before uh, up in the hills, and uh, I went skydiving a couple of years ago. That was a blast. Do I look like I'm having fun? And we went hang gliding, and uh, I, I like flying. I'm a pilot, and the family's got some kayaks up in Koval where we live, and we like to go kayaking down the river. Karen and I have our scuba certificates, and we've been scuba diving um, the Barrier Reef and the Caribbean and other places. And as I said, I still have my pilot's license and like to fly around. I got a picture here. That's Angie. I think John took this picture, and uh, that's my son Micah. And uh, that's John and I flying, and you can see we're paying close attention to the instruments. We run heavy equipment, and uh, I, mean, I like working with my hands. And uh, a few years ago, I went back up to the cave when Micah, uh, firstborn son, was seven years old. And uh, went visiting. He's swimming there in the pool. It was freezing water that day. And I brought a Bible back up there. I just had felt impressed. I wanted to leave a Bible in the cave because of the way it had changed my life. And I'll never forget that experience. That was such a wonderful trip. It was just, Mike and I, is amazing. He made it. He was seven years old then. And it is a grueling hike up these desert mountains. Um, back in 2001, Karen and I were doing meetings in um, the Philippines. And we got some tragic news that Mike had died in a construction accident. And, you know, that was probably one of the hardest things that I ever went through, uh, that, we, that we went through. But uh, it, it helped me to realize in a special way how much our father must love us because losing our firstborn son like this uh, creates such a vacuum in your life. And you think about it every day, and it hurts every day. You never stop thinking about it. You never completely get over it. And then you think that God so loved the world that he willingly gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. You know, in the years that have passed, I was present when my uh, 
brother died. Falcon asked me to pray with him before he died. Karen and I came back from meetings in Russia. And uh, mom was in a coma. She died from bone cancer. Um, a few years later, back in 19, oh, 2003 or 2002, dad passed away. And uh, so we've lost all of the immediate family. Uh, can you tell I'm the black sheep? From looking at that picture, that's mom and dad, my brother Falcon. That was at Falcon's wedding. And uh, when dad died, we went to visit him. They wouldn't even let us say goodbye to him. Wouldn't let us in, into the door. Some gal was getting ready to marry him in a few days while he was in his hospital bed. And they were afraid we were going to find out. So I had flown out with my son Daniel in his military uniform. He's in the Marines right now. Stephen, named after dad. They wouldn't let us in because they were afraid we would interfere with the wedding. We just wanted to see dad and pray with him. He died not long after she married him, I think two weeks after from cancer. And the uh, whole family got, the whole estate got embroiled. And for the record, I never received a penny, a photograph from my father's estate since he's died. I could have gotten all mixed up in all that dispute, but the Lord says, Doug, I've called you to preach the gospel. Amen. And I keep remembering that scripture. What profit is it if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? You know, real happiness comes from who? From Jesus. Amen. We want to go off the air with this message. I'd rather have Jesus. Friends, is it your prayer this morning to say, Amen. I'd rather have Jesus? Father in heaven, help us to make that decision. To put Jesus first in our lives. To accept him as our Savior, knowing that he has a great plan for each one of us. And any who are watching, if they've not made that decision, may they come to Jesus just as they are today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. As humans, we all have addictions to sin. We're weak and unable to resist temptation. Ever since the fall of man, Satan has been working to destroy our happiness and drown out the voice of God with those soul-destroying addictions. Apart from God, we are powerless to resist evil. But by God's grace and power, we can experience true freedom from sin. Today's free offer, Tips for Resisting Temptation, covers 12 practical steps to have real power in your life today. You won't want to miss this practical guide for victorious living. Order online at amazingfacts.tv. Offer not available outside Canada, the U.S. and its territories. Or call 1-866-708-PROPHECY. That's 1-866-708-7767. Ask for the free offer, number 708, when you call. Or write to us at Amazing Facts, Post Office Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Don't resist the temptation to order this book. The entire Prophecy Code seminar is available on DVD, VHS, CD, and audio cassette. Please ask for the respective offer number listed on the screen that matches the format you desire. To order, call 1-866-708-PROPHECY or 1-866-708-7767. Offer not available outside Canada, the U.S. or its territories. Or write to Amazing Facts, Post Office Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. The future is now. Share it with a friend. I'd rather have Jesus than the houses or land and I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway I'd much rather have Jesus than anything this world.